today. I am going to talk about the basic foundation of knowledge for the practice of anapanasati. If your basic knowledge, if your fundamental knowledge of the practice of anapanasati is correct, then it will be very easy for you to practice anapanasati successfully and you will achieve the proper benefits from this practice. It won't be necessary for us to talk about all the details of the various steps and stages of the practice of anapanasati. Rather, we'll talk about some of the background issues and things that you need to know about. The first point we like to say is take life as the lesson. Take life as the lesson. Dukkha and the extinction of Dukkha is something that you must learn and study within yourself, by yourself, for yourself, and for the benefit of yourself. For this reason, it is necessary to take life as the lesson with which we study. We must learn from life. If we have successfully completed the entire practice of anapanasati, then we will know what life is, we will know what life is about, where life comes from, what the purpose of life is, and what it takes to fulfill the purpose of life. We can know all this through the successful and complete practice of mindfulness of breathing. So, if we take a logical presentation of this, we can say that through anapanasati, we will develop the following types of knowledge. Knowledge about what is life. Knowledge about where life comes from. Knowledge about why there is life or what life is for. And for how. How to fulfill the purpose of life. How to fulfill the benefits of life. So what where, why, how. Therefore, practice anapanasati in order to come to understand your own life. This is the proper way to practice anapanasati, in order to understand life and to understand all the problems that are related to this thing we call life. So these two aspects, life itself and the problems of life, are why we practice anapanasati. In short, we study life in life. We learn about life from life. With anapanasati, we study the breath. We use the breath as the object of our learning. Whether in Thai or in English, we generally associate the breath with life. When one stops breathing, one is dead. <laughs> life ends. When the breath ends, life ends. All over the world, we, we equate the two. And so when we study the breath, we are also studying life. So in Anapanasati, we study life by studying the breath. So therefore, we study the breath completely, deeply and profoundly, and sufficiently to deal with all the matters that we have been talking about. That is, about life, and the problems of life. We study the breath in this way 
in order to have a full understanding of life and develop the wisdom that is needed to solve the problems of life. This is what Anapanasati is about. If you observe carefully, you will see that using the breath is the easiest and most convenient way to study life. It is far more convenient than all the other different meditation objects. If we take some of the other traditional meditation objects, we'll see how, how convenient the breath is. For example, corpses. If we decide to meditate on corpses, then we have to go to the cemetery or a battlefield or a morgue or some place where they happen to have corpses laying around. This isn't quite as convenient as the breath. Or if we decide to meditate on the gasinas, which are different colored round discs, well then we have to go and buy one of these discs or make one or find one. And every time we want to meditate, we have to set it up. We have to put it away and carry it around. This can lead to a lot of unnecessary trouble. But with the breath, it, we don't have to put it away. We don't have to take it out. We don't have to go anywhere to find it. Wherever we are, the breath is with us. Wherever we go, the breath goes with us. As long as we're alive, the breath is always a handy, convenient meditation object. The meaning of the word anapanasati is the following. It is to note or contemplate or focus on some useful meditation object some object that we ought to focus on or contemplate while and every time let me, to focus on a useful meditation object while breathing in while breathing out anapana means breathing in and out sati is to be mindful so to to, while focusing the attention or contemplating a meditation object, there is mindfulness of breathing in and out all the time. For, it to, for us to be practicing anapanasati, it must be like this. Now, there are many, many different ways of practicing anapanasati we are going to talk about the way of practicing anapanasati that is both beneficial and is in line with Buddhist principles. The other kinds of anapanasati we will not be talking about. There are many ways of doing mindfulness of breathing. Not all of them are useful and not all of them are in line with what is taught in Buddhism. Imagine, for example, if you were to think of your wife or husband or child or someone back home in America, England, Germany, Canada, or wherever, and to think of this person every time you breathe in and every time you breathe out. This is anapanasati also. But this is not the kind of anapanasati we are going to talk about. But it is a kind of mindfulness of breathing. Here we are going to talk about the anapanasati that takes as its objects of contemplation things which are useful for the extinguishing, the stopping of dukkha. 
And so we will contemplate in Anapanasati, we contemplate these useful things, things that help, that contribute to the extinction of dukkha with every out-breath and every in-breath. This is the kind of anapanasati that we need. The other kinds are unnecessary. We need this kind of anapanasati that helps us to study things which will provide knowledge and wisdom that will help us extinguish dukkha. In the beginning of the practice of mindfulness of breathing, we take the breath itself as the meditation object. We focus on and study the breath, each in-breath and each out-breath. Then after that, we take up other useful things as the meditation object. But, this is very, very important, we maintain the mindfulness of the breathing. And so after the initial beginning stages of focusing directly on the breath, then other objects are noted, are contemplated, are studied, experienced. But there is always the breath in the background. There is always awareness of the breath as a rhythmic instrument, like a metronome. Breathing in, out, in, out, in, out. This is always there to make sure that mindfulness never eases, that is never lost, that it doesn't slip. It helps to maintain mindfulness constantly and consistently while the different objects are contemplated and studied through the practice. So in the first stage, the breath is used directly. Then we move on and use different objects while maintaining this background awareness of breathing in and out as sort of a, a rhythm, as a governor. And then the third aspect, final aspect of the practice of anapanasati is to contemplate the highest truths, the highest dhammas. But still, there is the mindfulness of breathing in and breathing out all the time, even while one is contemplating these highest dhammas or the highest truths of reality. This, this is an overall view of anapanasati. And for it to be anapanasati, there must always be the mindfulness of breathing in and breathing out, in, out consistently and constantly. This is what it means to practice anapanasati. In the first part of the practice, one way of looking at it, there are four parts, four major stages. In the first part, the breath serves a dual function. First, it is the object of meditation. We contemplate the breath. We experience and study the breath itself. But also, the breath serves as that background governor or regulator of mindfulness. So it's with every in-breath and every out-breath, we study the breath. So the breath is one both it is studied, that's the first use, and the second use, it regulates mindfulness. It is like a metronome, setting a rhythm of in, out, in, out. And so in the first part of the practice, the breath is used in these two ways. So after the beginning step of focusing directly on the breath, and using the breath as the rhythmic background, 
then we change the object to the longness and the shortness of the breath. No longer the breath itself, but the longness and shortness of the breath is the object. But still, the in-breath and the out-breath maintains itself as that rhythmic instrument in the background. So, with every in-breath and every out-breath, we focus on the longness of the breath or the shortness of the breath with every in-breath and with every out-breath. Next, we examine, we note, we contemplate, we study how the long breath influences the body, how the short breath influences the body. No longer are we focusing on the longness and shortness of the breath, nor are we focusing on the breath itself. Now we focus on how the long breath or the short breath influence the body every time we breathe in, every time we breathe out. We see how these, how the body or how the breath and the body are interrelated and how they influence each other. When the breath is long, we learn that the body relaxes. And when the breath is short, we learn that the body becomes disturbed or agitated. The truth, the fact of this interrelationship, of this influence which the breath, the long breaths and the short breaths have on the body, this truth, these, this fact is what we contemplate now at this point with every in-breath and with every out-breath. So it's a third object of study, still with mindfulness of breathing in and breathing out in the background. Now, next, we move on to contemplating, noting, studying the fact or truth that we can control the body by controlling the breath. This fact is the next object of the practice of mindfulness of breathing. We probably can't control the body directly. However, we can control the body indirectly through the breathing. So this control, or we, we make, we force the body to calm down by using the breath. This fact is the truth that is the object of meditation at this stage of the practice. This fact is contemplated every time we breathe in and every time we breathe out. A new object, but still that that rhythm of breathing in and breathing out is in awareness, is that basic mindfulness is in the background the whole time. So now, at this point, we are doing the fourth step of the first group or first part of mindfulness of breathing. And what we're doing now is relaxing the body by relaxing the breath. We are calming what is called in Pali Gaya Sankara or the body conditioner, the thing that conditions the body. This thing that conditions the body is the breath. So at this point, the breath is being calmed in order to calm the body. This fact is what we are studying. This is the object of contemplation at this point. But don't forget, always, for this to be anapanasati, there is mindfulness, this 
This fact is contemplated while breathing in. It is contemplated while breathing out. Every in-breath and every out-breath, this fact is contemplated. This is what anapanasati is. There is always this background awareness or mindfulness of the in-breath and the out-breath constantly without missing a one. And while this background mindfulness is maintained, we study these different objects. And the fourth object is the fact of calming the breath and of calming the body by calming the breath with every in-breath, with every out-breath. There is a Pali word, gaya, or in Thai, gai. This word is used, is usually translated as body, the physical body. The body is a gaya, this flesh body, but the breath is also a gaya, the breath body. This meaning, this is because the word gaya literally means group, which also the English word body has this same meaning sometimes also. We can talk of a body of people. So gaya means group. And so we talk about the breath group or the flesh group and see how these two gaya, these two bodies, the breath body and the flesh body, how they are interrelated. And by calming the breath body, the flesh body, the flesh gaya, is also calm and relaxed. With every in-breath and with every out-breath, this is studied. And so these steps up to this point are the contemplation of the body in the body the contemplation of Gaya, Gaya Nu Patsana is the, the full Pali word. So this is what has been happening so far with every in-breath, with every out-breath. The word Gaya can be applied in many different ways. It has many different meanings, this Pali word Gaya, which translates group. For example, the infantry of the army, which in Thai is Gong Tap. The infantry in the Pali language is called Pala Gaya. Pala means power, and Gaya is group, so it's the power group, <laughs> is the, the army that, the part of the army which attacks. So the Gaya can be applied to all sorts of animals, people, and things. But we don't have to bother ourselves with all these different meanings of the word gaya. At this point, we are only concerned with two meanings, two kinds of gaya. The group of breath and the group of flesh, skin, bones, blood, and all these physical things which make up the physical flesh body. These two kinds of gaya are very closely interrelated and interconnected. And so we study, we contemplate, we experience the calming and relaxing of these gaya, the breath gaya and the, the physical body gaya. This is this stage of the, what this stage of the practice is about. There are different methods for calming and relaxing the gaya. And we use these with every in-breath and out-breath. And focus on this fact with every in-breath and out-breath as the body, as the gaya, calms and relaxes. So this these first four steps make up the first group of steps or the first tetrad of the practice of anapanasati.
and it's directly interested in the breath and the body. So it's called the Gaya Ketred. Then we go on to study the Vedana or feeling. Then after that, Jita or mind or mind state or states of consciousness. And then to the fourth, Dhammas or mind object or eternal truth. So there are these four different groups of objects which are contemplated throughout the practice of Anapanasati. Different objects are taken at the different stages. And all, all together there are 16 steps or 16 different objects which are used. However, there is always the background awareness, the background mindfulness and knowing of the breathing in and breathing out. Whether the object is the breath or something related to the breath, whether the object are the feelings, the Vedana, and things related to the Vedana, or whether it is the mind state or the Dhammas, the mind object. Whatever is being taken as the meditation object directly, there is always the background rhythm of the mindfulness of breathing in and breathing out from the very beginning of the practice all the way to the end, even to the very last step of the practice, which is the contemplation of successfully completing the practice. When you get to the end, you have to realize it. So at this last stage, one realizes that one is finished while breathing in and breathing out. This basic awareness of breathing in and out is, is used all the way through the practice. This is what it means to practice anapanasati, to always have this background awareness. Mindfulness of the breath must always be there, otherwise it is not mindfulness of breathing. And with this basic mindfulness of breathing, a variety of objects are studied in order to develop wisdom and understanding. There are six, these 16 objects or 16 facts or truths are what is studied in order to develop the necessary wisdom to deal with life's problems. The direct objective of the practice of Anapanasati is to extinguish suffering. This is the, the only valid reason for practicing Anapanasati, to extinguish suffering. However, there will be various side effects, side benefits, <clears throat> various extras. For example, good health, good physical and mental health will be developed through this practice. The calming and relaxing of the breath of this consistently long breathing has beneficial effects for the health. And the calming and relaxing that happens during the process is very good for both the body and the mind. So the, the specific objective or goal of this practice is to extinguish dukkha. However, good physical and mental health and other benefits will also be developed through this practice. And so in this way, we profit from anapanasati much more than the cost we have to invest. As far as the, the good health of the body goes, just in this way, our efforts are repaid the, the cost of the practice are, are returned, our investment pays off. Just by the fact that by the developing of peaceful, calm, relaxed breathing, peaceful, calm and relaxed body, that this return of the body to a natural state of calmness and coolness 
this in itself is is worth this in itself justifies the practice of anapanasati this is one benefit of the practice another benefit of anapanasati is anapanasati can be used to limit and get rid of bad moods or dangerous emotions bad mind states such as anger fear greed so say fear arises in the mind through the by practicing anapanasati the fear will be calmed and then gotten rid of or anger can be gotten rid of by practicing anapanasati all kinds of unhealthy unskillful states of mind bad emotions bad moods can be taken care of can be gotten rid of can be calmed by the practice of anapanasati now in this way it only takes care of these things temporarily and if we're not mindful and wise these things will return however if anapanasati is continually and fully developed it is possible that a point will be reached where these bad moods these dangerous emotions will never return again they will never arise further so this is another benefit of anapanasati another benefit of the practice of anapanasati is that one will know the moment of death one can will know when one is going to die by fully practicing this met, this meditation practice by fully developing it all the time not just for 5 or 10 minutes a day but constantly throughout the day for one's entire life one gets to know the breath in such detail one comes to know everything there is to know about the breath then one is an expert about the breath to such a degree that one will know which breath will be the last one this is from fully understanding the breathing there's a story in the scriptures about one teacher who had who was very old he had been practicing anapanasati for a long time and had become very skillful he had been he was an expert in it and so as he was getting old the time was coming and he knew it was coming and he called two of his students to a a field of grass and he had them stand in the field of grass and then he walked to one end of the field and then he walked to the other and that while the two students were in the middle and then he walked back and forth about four or five times and then he came back and when he was standing right between the students he died and they caught him and then took the body away and this he he knew the moment when he would die because he was such an expert because he was so skillful in regards to the breath this was from having studied it so thoroughly so constantly and consistently that this knowledge was obtained this is another benefit of the practice of anapanasati so if you wonder when you're going to die here's one way to this won't enable you to choose the moment of death it can't it doesn't work that way it only enables one to know which breath will be the last will know at what breath the the conditioning that maintains the body at what point that conditioning will will stop and at that point where the body breaks up that point we call death one can know at what breath that will happen through this practice but this is not a way to to choose <laughs> the moment of death it's knowledge not not magic another benefit 
they're getting even better, is that through consistently and constantly practicing anapanasati all the time, one more fully and completely develops knowledge of the the higher truths of reality, meaning one fully develops the understanding and awareness of impermanence, of unsatisfactoriness, and non-self. So by the consistent practice of anapanasati, these characteristics of reality are fully, are more completely understood. In addition, this practice of anapanasati, the correct and proper practice of mindfulness of breathing is identical with being on the Eightfold Noble Path. When one's practice of anapanasati is correct, at that time one is on the path, on the Noble Path, which has eight aspects. So this is a further benefit. The understanding of, of reality, of higher truth, of impermanence, and satisfactoriness and non-self, and one is, through this practice, one is on the Eightfold Noble Path. One is following it correctly. At one point in the scriptures, the Buddha said that if if monks are living rightly, the world will not be free of arahans. Arahans are perfected beings or enlightened beings. These are, are beings in whom the gilesa, the defilements of mind, such as anger, greed, envy, fear, stupidity, and ignorance, do not arise. In these fully perfected beings, all the defiled mental states do not arise. The Buddha said that through living rightly, or existing correctly, or being, being properly, I guess living rightly is the best translation. Through living rightly, the world will not be empty of arahants, of perfected beings. Now this living rightly, existing rightly, what does it mean? It means practicing anapanasati. If one is practicing anapanasati correctly, then one is living rightly. And so if you would like to help the world to not be free of enlightened beings, you can do this by correctly practicing anapanasati. If you want to keep the possibility alive that there will be enlightened beings in this world, the best way to do this is to live rightly is by living rightly. And to do that means to practice, or a way to do that is to practice anapanasati, mindfulness of breathing in and breathing out. Practice anapanasati will bring the benefit of developing the four Dhamma comrades that we spoke about the first time. Don't forget these four, four comrades in Dhamma of Sati, Sampajanya, Samati, and Banya. Mindfulness, Sati, Sampajanya, wisdom in action, Samadhi, the one-pointed unified mind, and Banya, wisdom. The importance of these four comrades these four Dhamma comrades, is that, this is to summarize, 
or to remind you, is that whenever a sense object of some sort comes, comes to one, if these four comrades are able to go out and meet that sense object, whether it comes through the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, or mind, then there will be no danger in that sense object. However, if any sense object strikes one and is not dealt with correctly by these four comrades in Dhamma, then that sense object will be dangerous. We can see these sense objects as our enemies. They are far more dangerous than any, any communists or thieves or who knows what. And the only way to deal with these enemies is with these four comrades in Dhamma. Mindfulness, wisdom in action, one-pointedness, and wisdom. And then when these comrades meet and deal with all these, all the different enemies of sense objects, the, all the sense objects, then they are no longer dangerous. And there's no, there are no problems that arise because of them. This is, this is another way or reason for practicing anapanasati. If we look even deeper, a more profound benefit of the practice of anapanasati is that it lessens the anutsaya. Anutsaya we can translate as tendencies. What these are, are accumulations or deposits of little bits of defilement. Whenever a defilement such as greed, anger, or ignorance arises, through its arising and passing away, it leaves a little something behind. It drops a few things. And these build up. These build up, the build up are these deposits. These accumulations are called the anusaya. And they are a real problem because once enough builds up, they, this is in itself a source of further defilement. So it becomes habitual. These are sort of tendencies which are developed. Now, anapanasati can clean out these deposits, this filth which builds up in the mind through the, the familiarity with defilement. It's a tendency and it's, it's habit and familiarity with, with defilement. These are the anusaya. And anapanasati will help to clean up these things so that they will lessen and abate. And it is possible that the point will be reached where the anusaya, where these accumulations, these deposits, will be completely cleaned up. When this happens, there will be no more defilements, no more problems. This is to be enlightened or to be perfected. And so through the practice of anapanasati, these anusaya, these tendencies which are sources of defilement, will lessen. And in, on the other hand, enlightened tendencies or familiarity with enlightenment will develop. This is another benefit of the practice of anapanasati. I'd like to introduce you to the Thai word anisong. It's strange for English speakers, but in Thai and Pali, it's a very common word, anisong. It means flowing advantage, or an ad advantage flowing outward. So we'll talk about a final anisong, or flowing advantage of anapanasati. This final advantage 
is that the mind is no longer disturbed, bothered, or pestered, no longer hassled by anything whatsoever. The defilements no longer bother the mind, no longer afflict and harm the mind. The hindrances, the nivarana, nivarana, these no longer disturb the mind. Goodness no longer bothers the mind. Sadness no longer afflicts the mind. All these various kinds of dukkha are no longer problems. None of these things can afflict the mind anymore. Instead of being a slave to happiness and sadness or goodness and evil, the mind is emancipated. It is free of all these things, of all this dukkha. This is the final anitong of the practice of anapanasati. This is the objective stated in the very first page of the Bible, first page of Genesis, where God forbid Adam and Eve to eat of the fruit of the tree of good and evil because they would die if they did so. Here is the way to make up for that original sin. Eating from that tree, from that eating that fruit, was to become afflicted to attack by attachment to good and evil, to sadness and happiness, to become a slave, to become slaves to all these things. And when the mind is enslaved, there is dukkha. This final anisong of the practice of anapanasati is to, for the mind to be emancipated from all these defilements, hindrances, all these happy, all these sad things, for the mind to be above all this duality, completely non-attached, completely emancipated and free, where there is no dukkha. This is the, the empty mind or the void mind, completely void of self, of I, of me and mine. This is the final anitsong of the correct practice of anapanasati as we have been explaining it today. And I left out a small part. <laughs> Further way of looking at this final anitsong is that through this correct practice of mindfulness of breathing, one becomes the one who knows, the awakened one, the blossomed and opened one. This third one is difficult, but these are three. This is Putta, or you're more familiar with Buddha. Buddha, the one who knows, the awakened one, the one who is totally alive and opened up like a, a rose that has fully blossomed to the world. <laughs> Perpetual bloom. A point where he, you don't will. <laughs> this, this is the final anitsong, is to be, to develop, to be, to realize Buddha. The, the knowing, the highest kind of knowing, to be completely awake, always, never asleep, never dull, never groggy, always wide awake and alert, and to have the freshness, the beauty, the openness to everything, to experience, to reality, to the world, of a, of a rose that perpetually blooms, or a, flo a lotus that is always fully blossomed. This is the final anitsong of ana, of the practice of anapanasati. The last thing which you should know is that the Buddha said, I was enlightened through the practice of anapanasati. 
These are the words of the Buddha. There are many people are quite so interested in anapanasati and are more interested in the sati patana. Four sati patana. These are generally called the four foundations of mindfulness, which the first one is the body, the second one the feelings, the third the mind, and the fourth the dhammas or mind objects. And these four foundations of mindfulness are taught with all kinds of different ways of fulfilling these four foundations. And sometimes it can get quite complicated and people are juggling a variety of different medi meditation practices. The way that is most efficient, most simple, and most beneficial, and most certain of fulfilling these four foundations of mindfulness is the practice of anapanasati. Certain people will only use anapanasati in the beginning stages and then move on to other techniques. And they, do, they overlook the fact that anapanasati alone can fully perfect can fully complete and fulfill these four foundations of mindfulness. So, to, the easiest way to practice the four foundations of mindfulness is to practice anapanasati. It is not necessary to bring in other techniques in order to do so. Anapanasati alone is sufficient. The Buddha did not say the following, I was enlightened through the practice of the four foundations of mindfulness. He never said that. He did say, I was enlightened through the practice, through the development of anapanasati. That is why here we take the anapanasati sutta as a foundation in both practice and in teaching about mindfulness of breathing. We take the discourse on mindfulness of breathing itself as the basic place of reference rather than the, the discourses on the four foundations of mindfulness because the Buddha himself said that he was enlightened through the practice of anapanasati, not the four foundations of mindfulness. It is request at this point that today's talk be finished. Thank you once again for coming to Suen Mok.